Welcome to this talk about bumblebees. Bumblebees are a lovely group to become familiar with. Of the 25 species in Britain, there, are, there is a big eight as described by the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. They refer to these as the commonest species that are most likely to be seen. This talk will discuss identification tips about the Bumblebee Conservation Trust's Big Eight. Also, I will talk about the six cuckoo species, which are identifiable by their association, association with these bumblebees, as well as their physical traits. Seven bumblebee species that I will talk about today are commonly found in gardens, and the eighth is more of an upland and open countryside species, although the others can be found in the countryside as well. I will show you how to encourage bumblebees in your garden and outside spaces, and we will look at their life cycle. There are some interesting fictional tales buried in stories of folklore and magic. And lastly, I will discuss how to take part in the Bumblebee Conservation Trust Bee Walk Survey, um, and how you can provide records that will contribute to both local and national recording schemes. Unless attributed otherwise, photographs are my own, a short word of warning, bumblebee identification isn't that easy and possibly this session may raise more questions than we have time to talk about today. There is plenty that isn't covered in this talk and I would highly recommend that you consult an identification guide when looking at bees in the field and I make some recommendations at the end of the talk. So let's look at the bumblebee. So let's look at the bumblebee. They are furry and larger in size than their solitary cousins. This is a queen red-tailed bumblebee. The queen is the largest cast of bumblebee and is about the size of an acorn. Worker or female bumblebees and males are smaller than the queen. The top half of the bumblebee is called the thorax. So that's this area here, that's the head, um, pronotum here and then to this area here is known as the thorax. The lower half is, is the abdomen, so from where the thorax ends, the abdomen is this area here. The bumblebee has six legs and it is usually the hind legs, the hind tibia, that we need to check for certain features. Coloration is important to identify species and you may need to look at the bee closely to see some distinguishing features other than purely colour. Do be aware that coloration isn't everything. Bees can fade and become worn as the season progresses. Also, there are sometimes individuals that can be melanic, that is black, or sometimes they will not appear quite right, and that's due to an aberration or a difference with that particular bee, and more close examination is needed. A hand lens and a clear pot with a well-fitted lid are useful tools to contain the bee and enable you to examine it more closely. So what is a bee? The bee has antennae which are segmented as you can see, see here these different segments on the antennae are called flagella segments. Males have 13 and females have 12. All bumblebees have compound eyes there's the compound eye. They also have three smaller and simple eyes on top of the head which you can't see here but they're under the under the hair there. You can see them on some bees but not really bumblebees because they're too they're too furry. These are called the ocelli and they are sensitive to vibration. There are 25 bumblebees and six of these are cuckoo species. That is bumblebees that enter the nest of others to take over the nest and to allow it to rear its own young. True female bumblebees, that is not the cuckoo species, have a shiny hind tibia, which we'll look at in more detail later. So what is a bee? So bees evolved from wasps 40 million years ago in the early Cretaceous period. They're in the order of Hymenoptera, which covers bees, wasps and ants. They have two pairs of wings which are connected together with rows of hooks. The majority are solitary. All bumblebees are social species. 
bees are plumose, where the hair is, hairs are branched, uh, especially to the hind legs um, and the abdomen. All bumblebees are equipped with stinging apparatus. True bumblebees have corbicula on the hind legs, which are used to collect pollen and are known as the pollen basket, which is shown here. So this area here uh, on this bumblebee is the pollen basket. So it's surrounded by hairs and there's a, a shiny corbicula or pollen basket there in the center where the pollen is stored. Male bumblebees don't have this area on the hind legs, just hairs. Male bumblebees don't collect pollen and play no role in the bumblebee nest. Bees are closely related to wasps. Bees feed their young a pollen and nectar mix. Wasps feed their larvae with invertebrate prey. So let's look at some numbers. How many have we actually got? We've got 269 bee species. Um, in the UK, although, you know, bee species are being split and found um, quite regularly now with uh, movements in DNA. There are 25 bumblebee species. There were 27, but two of those um, are classed as extinct. There was one that was extinct uh, called the short-haired bumblebee, uh, but that's now been reintroduced um, in 2011. There are 25 bee genera, 248 wasps, and nine of those are social, the rest are solitary. So how do you distinguish, distinguish a fly uh, from a bee? So um, this is quite a nice plump uh, fly called Bombylias canesans. Uh, they've got no waist as such, and they have two wings. This isn't a bumblebee, as I'm sure you can tell. It's an Amada species of bee, uh, but it's just to depict really that they're wasted. So they've got this distinctive waste rather than um, as a fly, which, which doesn't have that. And they also have uh, four wings rather than two. So there is some fascinating folklore and superstitions that are uh, attached to bees. Bees are often associated with health or wealth in ancient folklore. Surprisingly, bees have been long associated with witches and witchcraft, so it's not all about cats and broomsticks. One Lincolnshire witch is said to have had a bumblebee as her animal familiar. The author J.K. Rowling named Professor Albus Dumbledore after an archaic English word related to bees. In Celtic mythology, the bee is a messenger between our world and the spirit realm. The ancient pharaohs used the honeybee as the royal symbol during the period between 3000 BC and 350 BC. And the Greeks believed that a baby whose lips were touched by a bee would become a great poet or speaker. So back to the present day and let's look at the bumblebee life cycle. The bumblebee queen will emerge in spring. She has already mated in the autumn before going into the dormant phase where she will overwinter. Once emerged, the queen will build her reserves by feeding upon nectar. Sites that they will use for nesting will vary between species in terms of habitat. And some will nest on the surface or just below the ground in grassy tussocks, such as the common carder species, Bombus pascorum, which is shown here. Mostly old rodent nests um, underground will be favoured by bumblebees. They think it's something to do with the, with the odour. Bird boxes and holes in trees or roof spaces will be used by the tree bumblebee, which you can see here. So once the nest site is prepared, the queen bumblebee will begin to gather pollen to store in the nest for the young to feed on. She lays her eggs in the nest, which she will brood to keep warm. The eggs hatch into larvae, and these larvae have four instars, so they'll change four times before they develop to an adult. They take 10 to 14 days to develop, and they use pollen to feed upon. 
They then spin a cocoon and then they'll pupate and hatch. Once the first worker's hatch, the queen ceases to forage. Female or worker bumblebees will assist with the feeding of any new larvae by continuing to gather pollen and take this back to the nest on their hind legs. The queen will just then go on to produce eggs from now on and she doesn't leave the nest again. Dependent on the species, worker or female bumblebees will live between 13 to 41 days. So it's quite a variety depending on the species. Here is a short film of a newly emerged queen bumblebee that I took this year. Males are produced later in the season and they just feed themselves on nectar and mate. A male bumblebee will deposit pheromones on aerial features such as fence posts, leaves or tree trunks and they will attract a female. This is a male white-tailed bumblebee. Some male bumblebees have yellow fluffy faces. It is suggested that once the males leave the nest they don't return. Nest sizes vary between species and a well-established um, buff-tail bumblebee nest may have up to 400 bumblebees. Later in the laying cycle, the queen begins to produce eggs which will become new queens and males. Studies suggest one mating only per female and new queens will leave the nest and mate. Once mated, the new queen will feed herself up before she finds a suitable site to overwinter. The old queen will die and eventually the workers and males will as well. The new queen will become dormant and overwinter in a north facing site where it's cool. This reduces the chance of emerging too early in the spring when there may be little in the way of nectar sources to exploit. However, with climate change, some species are emerging earlier now than they used to. Bumblebee species differ in the way that they will feed their larvae in the nest. Some species create a pocket by making a wax pouch. This is near to the brood and they will feed from this. It's filled with clumps of pollen that's brought in by the workers and the queen will also supplement this by regurgitating a mixture of pollen and nectar for the brood. Pocket storer species of uh, bumblebee are the garden bumblebee and common, gar uh, common carder bumblebee. Some species are pollen storers, which means that the pollen brought in by the workers is stored in empty pupil cells. The workers and the queen feed the larvae in a mixture of nectar and pollen a bit at a time, and this is given individually. Therefore, the larvae of pollen storers uh, will receive, apparently, a fair share of food. However, as the larvae of pollen storers are competing to receive food, a size difference can be more marked in these species. Buff-tailed and early bumblebee, tree bumblebee, heath bumblebee and red-tailed bumblebee are all pollen storing species. Sometimes you may see bees with mites attached to the thorax. They will not harm the bumblebee in any way and develop in the bumblebee nest. These mites will scavenge on the detritus of the nest and then once they're mature they'll hitch onto the bumblebee, particularly new queens. They may overwinter with her and move into her new nest in the spring. Interestingly, these mites also have tiny microscopic mites that live on them. So not so harmless are some species of fly. The canopid or large headed flies, uh, which you can see on the left here, will intercept a bumblebee and insert an egg into the abdomen of the bumblebee, usually whilst they're in flight. The egg will hatch into a larvae inside the bee and live as a parasite in her body. She will eventually die and the fly larvae will pupate and emerge the following summer as an adult fly. The canopid in the picture is Sicus ferrugineus and it's common and widespread. Volucella bombillans seen here on the right is another species of fly and it's a hoverfly. They are good bee mimics 
This form of volucella bondolans is, is yellow and black. There is also a red and black form. They are distinctive by the cloud in the wing are an example of malarian mimicry, which evolved as their protection by mimicking bees in their coloration. The female enters the bumblebee nest and lays her eggs, and the larvae then feed upon the bee larvae and nest detritus. They overwinter as a pupa and emerge as an adult the following year. The bee moth, however, is quite destructive. The adult moth enters the nest and lays its eggs. Once hatched, the caterpillars will spin silk throughout the nest and will eat the food stores and the bee larvae. In this way, the whole nest can be destroyed. The larvae then leave the nest to spin a cocoon over the winter, pupating in spring and emerging as adult moths in the summer. Bumblebee Conservation Trust refer, refer to the big eight species. These eight species are commonly found in gardens and the wider countryside. The exception being the heath bumblebee, which is uh, actually depicted here, uh, and this is more abundant in moorland and upland habitats. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the uh, buff-tailed bumblebee. Buff-tailed bumblebee or Bombus terrestris. It's considered to be common and widespread all over the country, including highly urbanised settings, woodland, arable farmland and uplands. It's one of the first to emerge in the spring, sometimes in February in the Mid Wales area. It has two dark yellow bands, one on the thorax and one on the abdomen. The large sized queen has a buff coloured tail. The females or the worker cast will have a white tail and can be difficult to tell apart from white tailed bumblebee female workers. However, the tail will have a narrow buff coloured area adjacent to the black area on the abdomen and the yellow banding is a darker yellow than in white tailed females. So maybe you can just see that little banding here. Uh, it is difficult to see, especially when you've got a bee, you know, that's moving around, but you can, you can just see that in this photograph. Males of this species are similar and have buffish coloured tails. As with all male bumblebees, they do not have the shiny pollen collecting areas on the hind legs as they don't need to collect any pollen. They will have black haired faces. This is a queen white tailed bumblebee. She's similar in size to the buff tailed. Once again, they are common and widespread and found in a variety of habitat. The yellow bands are situated across the thorax and the abdomen and is a brighter lemon colour than in the buff-tailed bumblebee. The female or workers are difficult to separate between, the two, between two other similar species, which I'm not going to discuss today. It is one of a complex of three species which are closely related. For this reason, it's best to record two banded white-tailed females as Bombus leucorum ag, which is short for aggregate. The male white-tailed bumblebee has yellow, a yellow furry face and can have quite an, exte an extensive area of lemon yellow banding, as is evident in this photo. Due to the yellow furry face and this quite extensive yellow banding, it is possible to distinguish between the male white-tailed and buff-tailed males as they have black haired faces. Two bumblebee species of the big eight we're talking about today have three yellow bands and a white tail. This is a queen garden bumblebee on the right and a female heath bumblebee on the left. They do look similar, similar however there are also some differences. The garden bumblebee Bombus hortorum is common and widespread and occurs in a variety of habitats. It has a long shaped face and to appreciate this you need to look at it from the front. Also it has a long tongue and will be seen exploiting flowers with a long corolla such as foxglove. The hairs around the pollen baskets on the hind leg are black. Males are similar to females and have black haired faces. Sometimes melanic or black forms are recorded. 
The garden bumblebee is similar to another species of bumblebee called the large garden bumblebee, Bombus ruderatus, and also the short haired bumblebee, Bombus subterraneus, which I'm not going to talk about today. These two species are not as common or widespread as the garden bumblebee. The short haired bumblebee was reintroduced to Dungeness in Kent in 2011. The heath bumblebee, Bombus genellus, may appear to be similar to the garden bumblebee, but it's more of an upland species. Heath bumblebee also tend to have a shaggier, unkempt appearance, but the species will need to be seen together, really, for this to be appreciated. It has a small round face, as opposed to the long face of the garden bumblebee. The pollen baskets, the hairs on the hind tibia are pale, whereas they're black, in the garden bumblebee and that's a good feature to look for. Males are similar to females and have substantially yellow haired faces as you can see in the smaller photograph. This is the kind of habitat that I've recorded the heath bumblebee from and they're often found on heather. Another white tailed species is the tree bumblebee, Bombus hypnorum. They're quite distinctive to look at with the three colours to the body, they can also have melanic types. Female workers are smaller versions of the queen. This species is also named as it will use holes in trees, bird boxes or roof spaces to nest in, as they prefer to nest above the ground. Males tend to have brown hairs on top of the head and are otherwise the same coloration as the females. So they're considered really to be the new bees on the block. Uh, they were first found in Britain in 2001. Uh, they've spread very rapidly throughout the country, now recorded in Scotland and even in Iceland. Some red-tailed species of the big eight are uh, Bombus praetorum or early bumblebee, which is shown here on the left and the red-tailed bumblebee Bombus lapidarius, which you can see on the right. There are some other similar species with a red tail of the 25, which I won't talk about today. This is a queen red-tailed bumblebee in the main photo. Female workers are a smaller version. The queens are large and furry and the red-coloured tail does not extend above half of the abdomen. This is important as there are other red-tailed species in which the red tail is more extensive. It will inhabit woodland areas, gardens and scrub, and it is widespread and common. Males look quite different as you can probably make out in the smaller photograph. They will have a pale yellow band across the top of the thorax, a weak yellow band across the rear of the thorax, a yellow haired face, an orange haired hind tibia, This is the early bumblebee, Bombus praetorum. It is a smaller bumblebee than the others, and even the queens are smaller than the other queen species as mentioned. They have a small red orange coloured tail. They are recorded as widespread and common and found in a wide variety of habitat. The queen on the left has a yellow band across the top of the abdominal section, the first tergite. They have a small area of peachy red orange to the tail. Female workers are similar, but they may have a weak band of yellow on the abdomen or even none at all, as you can see in the central photo. Males on the right are quite fluffy with yellow faces and heads, a yellow band across the top of the thorax and a yellow abdominal band as well as the small peach coloured tail. Nesting can occur in a wide variety of locations, including underground and in old mammal burrows, but also at some height in roof spaces, bird nest boxes and rot holes in trees. The common carder, Bombus pascorum, is a long-tongued species that is widespread and common and found in many different habitats, including gardens. They have brown ginger hair to the thorax with variable amounts of black hair to the abdomen, usually in bands. The sides of the thorax are creamy white. There are four brown bumblebee species in the UK. 
and the three other will be found in more specialist habitat and are usually restricted to coastal areas. The moss carder is entirely ginger brown on its thorax with no black hairs in, on the thorax or abdomen. The shrill carder has a dark band in the middle of the thorax and the abdomen has mainly pale hairs but may have darker coloured bands and a ginger red tail when fresh. The brown banded carder has a ginger thorax with a few black hairs around the wing bases, no black hairs on the abdomen and a faint band of brown hairs on the second segment or the turgite. So do look at the abdomen with a hand lens if you can get close to this bee and examine the hairs. According to the entomologist Stephen Falk, in the male common carder, occasionally the abdomen can be entirely black haired and it can resemble the tree bumblebee. In males, the mid flagella segments of the antennae are apparently bulbous underneath, though I've never seen this feature. It isn't an easy species to identify confidently, saying that it is widespread and common. But beware if you're in a chalk grassland area or a coastal area with vegetated shingle as the other brown carder species may inhabit these areas as well. So let's look at some of the cuckoos. Overall cuckoos are similar to the host however there are some differences. Here is the wing of a true what we call a true bumblebee, not a cuckoo, so it's nice and clear. In the middle we've got the hind tibia of the female and queen bumblebees, which you'll see you've got the corbicula, the pollen basket, and it's nice and shiny. And you've got the hairs along the outside of the pollen basket. In the cuckoo bumblebees the key, tra the key traits are that it's less furry looking, so you can see the integument or the underlying body of the bee. It's a robust animal which will tackle the queen of the true bumblebee to take over the nest. Just looking at a cuckoo you might realise that the, the coloration and the pattern will look different than what you're used to seeing in a, in a bumblebee. The hind tibia as you can see here in the female and the males is, is hairy so there's no pollen basket. And some cuckoo species have darkened wings. You can see that here. This is quite quite dark. This is Bombus rupestris or the, the red-tailed cuckoo. And these are the cuckoo species. There's six in all. Vestal cuckoo, red-tailed cuckoo, forest cuckoo, gypsy cuckoo, field cuckoo and barbuts cuckoo. So this is a vestal cuckoo, Bombus vestalis, and it will, it's a kleptoparasite on the buff-tailed bumblebee. It closely mimics the species and it has a darker yellow band, as the buff-tailed bumblebee does, on the um, thorax here. Males will have a sulphur yellow flash at the end of the tail and a buff-coloured collar, and you can just see that little yellow flash. This is a male. The red-tailed cuckoo, Bombus rupestris, um, and this is a lovely specimen actually, you can see uh, the dark wings, you can see the hairy hind tibia, it's a really sort of um, butch looking animal isn't it, and um, it's, it's quite thin, it's not as fur, you know, the, the fur is less uh, dense than you would see on a, a red-tailed bumblebee. Males are smaller with clear wings, so this is um, a female. The forest cuckoo will be found on uh, early bumblebee, heath bumblebee and mountain bumblebee. Females are relatively small and fluffy. They have a broad yellow collar, an entirely black haired scutellum, which is this area here and an indistinct yellow band on Turgite 1, which is around here. Um, this is a male actually, and typical males will have a red and black tip to the white tail and a bright yellow collar, so you can see it's a nice 
um, a nice specimen. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the, the cuckoos today. Gypsy cuckoo takes over the nest of the white-tailed bumblebee. Queens are similar to the vestal cuckoo. The males are difficult to separate though between other male cuckoos in the field. And the field cuckoo takes over the brown card of bumblebee species. Bombus campestris is a very variable species. The barbut's cuckoo takes over the nest of the garden bumblebee. It's similar, but it has a round face rather than a long face. It can look similar, although um, lack of pollen baskets as well is an, obviously an, another key feature. So the cuckoo life cycle. The fertile queen cuckoo bumblebee emerges from its dormant state later on in the year than the true queen bumblebee. This allows her to exploit the fully functioning nest of the true bumblebee. She enters the nest that is already fully functioning and will overpower and often kill the established queen. She will then lay her own eggs in the nest, as well as kill and eat the host larvae too. The workers from the overtaken nest will then continue to raise the cuckoo young. She doesn't need to produce any male, any workers, just males and her own females. So how do we help bumblebees in the garden? Well, don't be too tidy. Uh, leave areas unmown and undisturbed. These areas can then be used by the bumblebee to nest in. Therefore, it's helpful to leave areas of long grass, have woody piles if you can, areas of scrub, which all help to provide nest sites for bumblebees. Try to incorporate flowering plants throughout the year. As bees can emerge in late winter, it's helpful to have nectar sources available throughout the year. Here are some typical spring flowering, flowering plants that are available for uh, bumblebees when they, if they emerge earlier. Crocus is very good. It's helpful to have different flower structures available for bees, all, bum, all bees, open flowers for short tongued species and flowers with longer corolla for the long tongued species. So these are quite open structured flowers. and some longer structured corolla. It's helpful to have um, flowering shrubs, trees as well in the garden if, you, if you've got the space. Um, they will flower early. Um, Stephen Falk, the entomologist, recommends and he's very keen that early cherries are available, especially one species prunus, Kerasifera, which is you know, quite easy to get hold of actually if you look on the, um, in the plant catalogues and on the internet. It's a spring flowering cherry, an ancestor of the domestic plum. Cherry plum is historically one of the first trees to blossom in the UK. Also Viburnum tinus um, will flower during the winter and into the early spring. And also winter flowering jasmine uh, jas jasminum nudiflorum which is a um, heavily scented and a nice winter flowering um, jasmine. So it's helpful not to have flowers that are too fussy or difficult for uh, bees or other pollinators to access. Um, so we've got the um, willow here which is um, an early flowering tree isn't it and um, very accessible to, to a lot of bees early on in the year. And then this peony, which is not very good actually um, for, for bumblebees and bees because they can't get in. It's, this particular variety is quite a closed um, flower. So yeah, difficult to access. And please um, avoid pesticides of any kind in your garden. Um, some pesticides will live for many, many years in the soil, um, so are really detrimental. So Ben thought it would be nice to incorporate a short quiz. Oops. 
Um, so I will play another short film and I'm going to read out some questions followed by the answers. So don't worry, I won't be testing you. Mm. While watching the film of this white-tailed bumblebee feeding, you can see how she gets right into the nectar at the base of the anthers of the crocus to feed. So I'll play that and I'll read out some questions. So, how many species of bumblebee are there in the UK? Bumblebees will often locate something to nest in. What is this? What features might make you think that you have found a cuckoo species of bumblebee? Which bumblebee can be distinguished from other species by having some black hairs on the upper part of the abdomen? And if you saw a bumblebee with a white tail and three yellow bands and a long face, which species might it be? So the answers, how many bumblebees species are in the UK? 25. Bumblebees will often locate something to nest in, a rodent nest. What features might make you think that you found a cookie species of bumblebee? So that will be dark wings, sparse hair and hairy hind tibia. The no pollen baskets. Which bumblebee species can be distinguished from other species by having some black hairs on the upper part of the abdomen? So that's the common carder. And if you saw a bumblebee with a white tail and three yellow bands and a long face, it would be the garden bumblebee. So she's very busy there. And that's the typical view that you get of bumblebees, isn't it, where they bottom up? Don't forget the bonus question, Janice. What species of bee are we watching on your crocuses? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No prizes though, Ben. <laughs> okay. So enable us to conserve bees, it's important that we know what bees are where. Bumblebee Conservation Trust have a bee walk scheme that anyone can become involved with. Anyone can become a bee walker. All you need is a spare hour or so every month to walk a fixed route of about a mile. The information collected by bee walk volunteers is integral to monitoring how bumblebee populations change through time. All data collected contributes to important long-term monitoring of bumblebee population changes in response to changes in land use and climate change. Bee Walk is a national recording scheme run by the Bumblebee Conservation Trust to monitor the abundance of bumblebees on transects across the country. These transects would be impossible without volunteers, so it's really crucial that, that people take part in this scheme, if you would like. The aim is to identify and count bumblebees seen on a monthly walk along a set route from March to October. So what do you need to do? You need to establish a fixed route of one to two kilometres. Fill out the site description form and set it up as a transect on the Bee Walk website. You then walk your fixed route monthly and record the bumblebees that you see and then you enter your records on the website. So it's important that if you're um, accessing private land um, that you do get permission from the landowner or the tenant. If you're going to do your bumblebee walk there somewhere private. So as I said uh, you walk the transect hopefully at the same time of, of day so you pick a time that's going to be available to yourself before you walk the transect and try and stick to that each each month. Make a note of the time and the weather at the start of the transect. If possible choose a warm sunny day when the bees will be out. Walk at a steady pace and don't linger at the best spots otherwise you'll skew the results. Take photos of any unknown or rare species or species you're not sure of and note the cast, so if it's a male, a female or a queen bumblebee. 
So as Ben mentioned earlier, there's a new Skills for Bees project in Wales, which is exciting. Um, because Wales is home to some of the rarest bumblebees in Britain, we need to know where our Welsh bumblebees are and how populations are doing to protect and conserve them for future generations. Skills for Bees Cymru is a three year project offering training and mentoring on bumblebee identification and surveying in order to improve our understanding of Welsh bumblebee populations. So if you'd like to become involved, Claire Flynn, who is the bumblebee um, officer for this, um, her email address is down at the bottom of the slide and Ben has the details as well if you'd like to contact Claire and get involved. So photographing bees, um, photography is easiest in morning or late evening. It's good to get a photograph if you can because um, you'll be able to examine it later uh, possibly and, and look at some features that you might not be able to see while the bees moving around. It's best to try and photograph them when it's a little bit cooler because the bumblebees will be a bit slower hopefully, um, not as not zooming around. Bumblebees are able to be on the wing when other insects are unable to fly because they're uh, furry, their bodies keep them warm. They're exploiting the time of day when there's more food available as other pollinators actually aren't able to fly around. The main areas of importance to photograph, um, these aren't obviously all bumblebees, but it's to get a top view if you can. So you can see the overall shape of the head, perhaps some bumblebees, you might need to see whether it's got a box shaped head, such as um, in uh, Rupestris or the red tailed cuckoo. Um, you'll be able to look at the coloration of the bee. A side view is useful, um, so you can see um, the coloration of the legs. This isn't a very good um, photograph actually here because it's loaded up with pollen. This is Andrina hemeroa, which is a solitary bee, uh, but this is an important feature in some solitary bees. Um, but also you need to see whether you've got pollen baskets or a hairy hind, uh, hind leg. And a front view um, is useful so you can see the shape of the face. So if it was a um, garden bumblebee, um, or heath bumblebee, you might be comparing the shape of the face, whether it's round, which is quite round here. This is a megacal species of solitary bee. Uh, so this is quite a round face, but obviously um, if it was garden bumblebee, it would have a long, a longer black face. And you might want to look if there's any markings on the face, um, not particularly in bumblebees, but in some other bee species, markings on the face is quite important. Just like to mention a few main points uh, just going over what Ben's already mentioned that are important when you're recording anything not just bumblebees. Um, so who you are, the name of the species that you're recording, where it was and provide a grid reference if you can and the date which also helps to might help to identify the species. Um, and also if you can put down the name if you if you haven't whether you identified the species obviously your name but if somebody's helped you to identify a species it's good to have their name as well because that might help add some weight to a tricky record for instance so here's a map of whitetail bumblebee records from this um, from this year so if you wanted to report your bumblebees, um, what, where do you send your records? So you can send them to the county recorder, so you can directly contact myself. Uh, my details are on the BIS website on the Radnorshire Wildlife Trust um, information. I've got a fairly new website called midwalesbeesandwasps.com. Um, so you can submit records directly to me through the website site there's a there's a space in the website to actually put your, your details in and, and send me a, a record directly you can also send your records to BIS so they have a new Lurk Wales app a fairly 
fairly new anyway and um, that's a good way of putting your records in. The BIS Wired, you can email that directly with your records or you can send them to iRecord. And some further reading suggestions. Um, this book by Dave Golson, Professor Dave Golson on bumblebees is quite an in-depth look at bumblebees but it's a really good book um, and there are two editions of that. It looks at behaviour and conservation and yeah, very detailed really but it's a if you're really keen on bumblebees it's a great book to get and then uh, this pocket guide to bumblebees very simple really pretty pretty basic but it's you know it's handy to stick in your pocket and take out with you in the field and this bumblebees book um, also pretty detailed there's two versions of that this is the this is the first edition but there's a second edition as well and it's it's a it still stands test of time and then Stephen Falk's field guide to the bees of Britain Great Britain and Ireland which is very detailed um, nice book to have and field guide to bumblebees of Great Britain and Ireland again quite a simplest a simple guide lots of um, coloured features um, nicely marked out and that's by Mike Edwards and Martin Jenner So, thank you for listening.